The New York City subway was mostly built by private companies. Then big government took them over. That is a claim that us transit nerds keep hearing and passively accept. However, this statement is extremely misleading and it hides the monumental role that the government played in delivering the system that we love and hate. So we all know that the New York City subway started with the IRT mainline. Open on October 27, 1904, this line attracted massive amounts of commuters and cemented the role that the subway would be the dominant circulatory system in New York City. But people also claim that this Z system was built by the IRT. After all, the IRT opened and operated this new subway. So, of course, they were the ones that built it, right? Well, what if I told you that the IRT as a company did not even exist when construction began? Construction of the New York City subway began in 1900, and the IRT began as a company in 1902. So, who really did construct the New York City subway? Well, the New York City municipal government plus a contractor. Back in 1868, the first rapid transit line opened. We all know it as the IRT 9th Avenue L. By the 1870s, using private money, the elevated lines were being constructed everywhere. But they had one major problem. Noise. The elevated lines were extremely loud and immediately became unpopular. The final nail in the coffin came in 1888 when the Great Blizzard occurred. This blizzard literally stopped the city because, you know, elevated lines were in best position to keep out ice and snow. They were in the air, for crying out loud. Anyway, this proved to the city that a subway line was needed, so they began planning. Mayor Abram Hewitt, who was a major proponent of a New York City subway line, advocated that the city pay for the construction of the New York City subway and have a private operator take over the line. This later was the foundation for the Rapid Transit Act of 1894, which, you guessed it, was passed in 1894. These were the following provisions in the act. 1. The city would pay money to construct the subways. 2. The subways were to be leased to a private operator between 35 to 50 years. 3. The private operator would pay a fee every year to the city. 4. The private operator would provide the rolling stock for the new subway. 5. The private operator would deposit $1 million that will be returned once the subways were completed. As you can see here, the first subways in New York were funded by the New York City government, not the IRT. Later in 1894, there was a referendum to decide whether the new subways were to be publicly owned. In a 132,000 to 42,000 vote, the people of New York decided that the new subway was to be publicly owned. This meant that while the IRT would eventually operate this new subway, all of the stations and track infrastructure was to be owned publicly, not privately. This began the work of planning for the New York City subway. There were many disputes, court cases, money issues, so this planning dragged on for six years. In the end, the commission appointed in the Rapid Transit Act decided on the Z system that we know today. This became contract number one. At a cost of $35 million or $1.25 billion in today's money, the new subway opened in 1904. This subway became extremely crowded and obviously the IRT was mocked for it. More extensions to the Bronx and Brooklyn, which was contract number two, only further increased congestion on the new subway. Something needed to be done. In 1906, Charles Evans Hughes was elected, and he set up the Public Service Commission. This commission began to study new subway lines and began to negotiate with the IRT and BRT to expand their systems. In the early 1910s, the city underwent another round of negotiations with the IRT and this time the BRT to build new subway lines. 
These negotiations obviously became very heated, because both companies wanted to one-up each other. Since the IRT and the BRT wanted to make as much money as possible, which is the objective of any business, making sure that as much new subway lines were under their territory was a must. This gave the city huge leveraging power, as when the BRT were awarded rights to the 4th Avenue line in Brooklyn, the Broadway line in Manhattan, and possibly the Astoria and Flushing lines, the IRT threatened to cut off negotiations. The city then threatened to give the H system that the IRT acquired to the BRT, which forced the IRT back on track. In the end, the city, the BRT, and the IRT agreed on the following provisions. 1. The city would pay $226 million of the $337 million cost of the new subway lines, and the private companies would make up the difference. 2. The IRT and BRT were to operate the subway lines with their own subway cars and motormen. 3. The fare would be fixed at 5 cents. 4. The city had the right to take over any subway lines. 5. The city would take a cut in profits every year to pay some of the construction costs. These were dual contracts number 3 and number 4. I want to mention two provisions in the dual contracts, namely the 5 cent fare mandate and the profits mandate. The 5 cent fare mandate is where some people would point to and say, see, that is big government taking control of the subways and running them to the ground, because inflation would eventually erode the nickel. Well, to respond to that statement, how would the subway companies know about World War I and its inflation? This was 1913 and the subway companies thought that they were getting a pretty good deal for the next 49 years, because they thought more lines equals more profits. Also, there was real estate to think about, as building subway lines made the land around it 4 to 12 times more valuable. Finally, the government was paying for two-thirds of the cost of the rail lines, and leasing them to the private companies. So maybe I am a bit crazy, but the government is absolutely justified in having conditions that would benefit the consumer. Because let me remind everyone here, prior to unification, universal free transfers were not a thing. Although the dual contracts would have the IRT and the BRT extend deeper into Brooklyn and Manhattan respectively, the IRT still had a major monopoly in the Bronx and Manhattan, and the BRT ruled Brooklyn. Since a main objective of dual contracts was to de-intensify the Lower East Side and shift them into the outer boroughs, the outer boroughs exploded in population. Workers started living in the outer boroughs and commuting into Manhattan, which meant that transferring between systems were necessary. This is why the fare was capped at 5 cents for so long. Even if the subway companies would raise the fare, cars would eventually make them obsolete. In the 1920s, the automobile would dominate the press in all of the funding. With more people buying cars, all of the investments would be going towards the automobile companies and roads, and in the 1940s, the subway companies wouldn't be able to survive. In fact, Increasing the fare would compel more people to cars, as countless studies show that raising fares would always lead to lower ridership. This is why in other U.S. cities, public transit would be bought out by the government, like in Chicago by 1947 and Los Angeles by 1958. Finally, the Great Depression, which would last 12 years, would cast doubt on whether the subway companies would be able to make it. Ridership plummeted for the first time since 1904, and whatever reserves that the companies would have would be eaten up. Remember that during the Great Depression, 86,000 businesses failed, and the unemployment rate skyrocketed to 25%. Expansion wasn't a priority during this time for the IRT and BMT. Surviving was. Without any outside help, these private subway companies would have been gone which they did by 1940. All of this goes to show that there are multiple factors in the demise of the IRT and the BMT, and fixating on the 5 cent fare mandate does not give the entire picture. The 5 cent fare 
only accelerated the demise of the IRT and BRT and did not cause the subway company's decline. Cars, on the other hand, caused their downfall. The second provision I want to talk about is about the profits mandate. In theory, the private companies were supposed to pay the city over the course of many years that would have covered the entire cost of dual contracts. But the subway companies successfully rewarded the contracts so that the provision would only apply if they met a quota. So out of the $500 million that the company collected in the two decades after the contracts, the companies only paid $2.1 million. This meant that basically, the private companies used the government as a piggy bank for their own priority. Which doesn't exactly back up the claim that the New York City subway was built by private companies. More like the New York City subway was built with government money and then leased out to private companies. Remember that the IRT and the BRT were subway operators and they were in the business of running trains, not building out entire subways from scratch. The city would fund the expansion projects and would lease them out to either the IRT and the BRT. That was how the subways worked before 1940. Now let's talk about the IND. In 1922, the IND was introduced by Mayor John Hyland. The subway was to compete with existing elevated lines, and this is where some people would go ballistic. How dare the government try to run the elevated lines out of business? Well, Hyland had pretty nefarious intentions, as he disliked the private companies after he got fired as a BRT motorman. But there are other reasons other than revenge and pettiness. There were two reasons why government officials wanted the IND. The first one was obvious, real estate interests. The elevated lines were extremely noisy and threw soot on the ground and in the air, and weren't the best for people to live along. So real estate companies have been long been proponents of tearing those elevated lines down. The second one is less obvious, but equally as important, age the elevated lines were extremely old. We all know about the elevated lines today, right? Those were mainly a remnant of dual contracts and were built to significantly higher standards. Yet, those elevateds were rotting by the 1970s and 80s. The IRT flushing line is the prime example of this, as the flushing line was extremely unstable and required a decade of rehabilitation work in the 1980s and 90s. Even so, stations on the flushing line are in the worst condition, and more work began this year to fix up those stations. The elevators built in the 1800s were built to a significantly lower standard. So you could imagine the amount of problems those elevators had back in the 1920s. Even though those elevated lines were retrofitted during dual contracts, again with government money, they were rotting. The IND aim to replace those elevated lines. So even though the IND had nefarious intentions, no one would deny that the IND would be vital to replace the aging elevated lines. The IND was obviously paid by the city and would be operated by the city. The first IND line opened in 1932, from Inwood to Chambers Street. Subsequent expansion to the IND came in 1933, when the IND concourse the IND South Brooklyn, and the first phases of the IND Crosstown and IND Queens Boulevard lines opened. However, with the Great Depression, the IND had very little money left over. So they turned to the federal government. Since FDR and LaGuardia, the mayor at the time, were best buddies, the IND first system was saved by New Deal money. With that, the IND Fulton Street line and the second phase of the IND Queens Boulevard line opened in 1936. The second phase of the IND Crosstown line and the third phase of the IND Queens Boulevard line opened in 1937, and the IND 6th Avenue line opened in 1940. In 1940, the IRT and BMT were bought out by the city. Since much of the subway network was under public control, 
the IRT and the BMT being bought out is a misleading statement. It was more like the IRT and the BMT sold their leases back to the city, as both companies were subway operators with long leases. With those leases sold back to the city, the IRT and BMT would cease to exist, because again, they were subway operators, and without anything to operate on, they were gone. As you can see here, much of the subways were built by the government, not private companies. The first IRT network was built and paid for by the New York City government. Subsequent expansions of the IRT and BMT networks during dual contracts were mostly funded by public dollars. And the IND was funded by city and New Deal money. With the 1940s, the city began to demolish much of the aging elevated lines. Although many rail fanners, myself included, would yell about the loss of the elevated lines, especially the 3rd Avenue L, it would be hard to think whether those lines would make it with how old they were. To show you how old they were, when planners were designing the 2nd Avenue subway, there were plans to link the subway to the 3rd Avenue L in the Bronx. However, that L was deteriorating, and in the Program for Action in 1968, the 3rd Avenue L was slated to be demolished, and a new line was to be built from scratch, using Metro North's right-of-way. You see, planners saw that it would be cheaper to demolish a line rather than to rehabilitate it. Obviously, some elevated lines from the 1800s lived, like the BMT Jamaica line, but they were the exception, and not the norm. By the 1940s and 1950s, the city would incorporate defunct railroads into the New York City subway. So in the end, here is a map of the New York City subway today. And here is a total of the lines that were built by private companies. As you can see here, it is not a lot. And most lines that were built by private companies weren't even by the BRT or the IRT, but by railroad companies like the LIRR. The only sections that exist today that were built solely with private money and by private companies was the IND Rockway Line built by the LIRR, the elevated section of the Canarsie Line built by the LIRR, then converted into a line by the BRT, the Brighton Line, half of the BMT Jamaica Line, a short section of the BMT Myrtle Avenue Line, the Steinway Tubes, and the IRT Dyer Avenue Line. So the next time someone says the New York City subway was built by private companies, you know better.